Howdy YouTube and welcome to this episode of The Gunman. So this video here, I'm gonna be taking you guys through the paintwork on this XE Jaguar. It's painted in Italian racing red and the color code is 1AF. We've just got a little bit of damage here on the guard. There's a bit of a dent there and we've also got a couple of scratches. So I've just got a bit of 320 grit onto my orbital sander, giving it a buzz back to get rid of the worst of the scratches. And I'm gonna put some fine filler in there to get rid of that dent. So we're right to put fine filler straight over the paint. Uh, some of the rough fillers, you shouldn't really put them straight over the paint. You should actually go bare metal first. But that will all depend on the exact kind of filler that you're using. I do know that some of the rough fillers or bogs, you are actually right to go over paintwork as well. So if ever in doubt, read the technical data sheet. So I'm just going to be going through quickly through the prep work. And then when we get into the paint booth, I'll slow it down and I'll show you more of the footage. So as you can see there, we've just given it a bit of a block back. I'll put a bit of a fine filler in there, blocked it down, got the edges sanded down, and then I'm doing a quick mask up for the primer stage. Now there was still a little bit of a low spot there, so I did put a good four coats on there, got my infrared lights onto it, baked it right out, and that's what I'm doing now. I'm just getting my eye up on that while it's got a wet coat, and I knew that there was still a little bit of a low spot there, and I was relying on the primer to be a primer filler, not just a primer surfacer. If I thought that I had that repair 100%, before I primed it, well then I would have probably just put two coats on it, sanded it back with the orbital sander and not worried about blocking it. But it turned out that I did have to give it a block down. So this is me just taking a few readings of the color while I've got the infrared lights on it. I've gone in, mixed the color up, sprayed it out. As it turned out, it was actually really good off the machine. You can see here, um, I didn't even end up having to do any color matching. It's actually a pretty cool color, this. And this color is also on some of the Range Rovers. It's got the exact same paint code, but they give it a different name. I can't remember offhand. They had some funny name for it on the Range Rovers. But yeah, Italian Racing Red 1AF. If you're looking for this color, it sort of nearly looks like uh, that Soul Red uh, 41V, that fake candy of the Mazdas. But um, next up, I just thought I'd give you guys a look at filling up my bottle. This is what I clean my panels down prior to uh, sanding. So that's just methylated spirits. And I actually just bought that myself because um, it's really good to clean the panels down. So I've been stuffing around a little bit with the mixtures. Now I'm buying it myself. I've been putting a little bit less in and um, it's still doing the job quite well. So putting the methylated spirits in there, it just cleans a little bit more than uh, standard water. There's nothing to stop you from using just uh, water by itself to clean your panels down with. Um, but yeah, just mixing it with the methylated Spirits does improve its cleaning capabilities and it's just going to get a bit more of the grease and grime off as well. Um, if there is any uh, extremely greasy areas, I'll obviously just get some uh, prep sole or wax and grease remover and then uh, remove those spots. But most of the time on, on a fairly clean car, you won't need to do that. You're just able to clean it down with the methylated spirits and water mixture and uh, yeah, off you go and start doing your prep work. So you can see I've obviously ran around with a piece of tape on the surrounding panel so that I don't hit them when I'm doing my prep work and then got my block out and I'm just giving that a good block down. So as I said before, I did know that there was still a little bit of a low spot there. So I'm giving it a good block down, feeling it with the palm of my hand with a flat palm, making sure that I can't uh, physically feel any low spots anymore. Once I can't feel them anymore, I'm going to give it a blow off or a dust off and then get some wax and grease remover or prep sole, we commonly call it over here, and that will emulate the wet look of the final finish. So you, uh, it'll give you a bit of a gloss over that primed area. Um, it'll dip disperse nicely over there. You wouldn't be able to use water. It doesn't really disperse evenly over the panel, as you can see here. I'm able to spray that uh, wax and grease remover over, and it's giving me a wet wet look over it. And it turned out that nah, there was still a little bit of low spot there. So I dried it back off, continued blocking, checked it again. Once I got it to uh, a stage that I was happy at, I then got the orbital sander out, got rid of those uh, block marks and uh, continued on with the grades. So I only used 320 grit on uh, that for the blocking stage. I didn't want to go and cut into the OEM paint too much and then have big cut throughs that are going to cause shrink back. So I just went 320 with the block and then I went 600 
uh, on the orbital sander. Uh, if I had have gone 180, which uh, sometimes I do on larger repairs, I'll block it down with 180, um, then I might go say 400 on the orbital and then 600. So uh, the final grade I personally use is 600. That's for blends and for painted areas. Um, I probably don't really recommend that. Not many people I know use 600 to prep their blends up with. I would have to recommend 800 to 1000 grit, but I know that these methods work for me. They seem to be a little bit quicker for me and I go through less sandpapers. But if you're not experienced uh, with those orbital sanders in your hand, I probably wouldn't recommend it because you're just gonna go and cut through and ruin your blends. At the end of the day, every job is different and they should be treated differently as well. So there's obviously a few rules of thumb that you're just gonna do on every single job. But um, yeah, as I say, I can block this with 320 and then go 600 grit, totally fine. If it was a larger repair or if uh, it did need uh, a bit more blocking into it, um, I might've gone 180 or even 240. Uh, but the final stages, uh, they're going to stay the same on my blend areas. And what I'm using here is a 800 grit softback sanding sponge. And I used 500 grit around the edges of the primer, what you saw me do just a minute before. Um, that's because if I was to use 800 grit on those primer edges, you'd just be sanding forever and ever, and it wouldn't cut through quick enough. So I find that uh, where you're putting your color, anywhere from 5 to 800 is usually pretty right where you're putting your color. But your blend areas, you can go, say, 600 to 1000 grit again that's going to depend on your confidence levels and what you're happy with but i would sooner tell people to start off with 1000 grit once you got your confidence up with the 1000 grit that you're not cutting through and you're not ruining jobs and ruining blends and stuff like that you might say go to 800 and then once uh, you're happy with the 800 go to the 600 and see if it works for you. Um, I know that uh, the other guys that I work with, they don't like using 800 grit around their blend areas either. They say that, oh, I get scratches when I do it. And I say, well, I like to leave my base coat a little bit thicker. I find that I get better coverage with it. And it also seems to fill in those scratches, obviously, whereas the other guys, where they have their paint that bit too thin, for my likings, it won't fill those uh, 800 grit scratches in on the blends and stuff like that. So they just use the gray scotch bright. Um, I also find that using the 800 grit, you're removing that orange peel, so actually cutting right into that uh, top coat of clear, that top layer of clear, whereas uh, if you're using scotch bright, you're sort of just going over the top of it and all that orange peel is still going to be there, so my way, you actually got, you got sort of more of a, a clean slate to put your paint over the top of. I've actually had an idea for a video which I'm going to be making soon, and that's going to be prep work for beginners, so I'll outline everything and uh, yeah, sort of give you a bit of a beginner's guide to prep work. Obviously next up, I'm onto my masking stage. I've just gone around, wiped all the edges down and then back it. Now I've got the piece of plastic over and taping it all down. So you might look at that panel and say, oh, there's still a bit of a layer of dust over there. It looks dirty. Um, why is that? You know, why didn't you wax and grease the remover it before you masked it? Look, I've done it both ways. Uh, I've tried wax and grease removing it before I masked it and after I've mastered it and I've done it without doing it and I've found you don't really have any improved results by wax and grease removing them twice. So you can see here, got the wax and grease remover with one of those DuPont Sontara cloths, so they're a lint-free cloth. I then continued to wipe that down until it was dry and next up I'm onto my tack cloth stage and just making sure all those edges and everything, every single square inch of that panel is dust free. Or as best I can anyway. Once I'm happy it's all cleaned down and free of any contaminants, of any dust or anything like that, I'm ready to start spraying my base coat on. So as you can see, it's pretty poor coverage with the solvent uh, reds. That's no new thing. They always have been pretty bad. Um, and obviously that's gonna depend on which paint line you're using, but this is standoff solvent based. So, you know, it's one of the better paints on the market and it's still average uh, coverage. So you've got a few things that you can do there. On an area this size, it's really not worth using a ground coat. Um, if, it, if I was doing a new door or something like that, or even a bumper bar, you know, I'd probably get some old reds that are sitting around on the bench, put that down first, get some coverage, and then go and put my top coat over the top of that. But for a, an area this size, it's not really necessary, and the amount of time you would even take to go and clean that ground coat out of your gun, you'd probably just may as well spend that time in the booth and put an extra coat of your matched color down instead. 
So now you can see I'm starting to do that blend. Uh, yeah, just sort of flicking it out a little bit and uh, not going too heavy on that blend area. So it's pretty straightforward and self-explanatory really what I'm doing there. Um, I don't know what I can say about my technique, but yeah, I don't like, I like to give myself a little bit of room when I'm blending. Um, I don't like to keep it too small. I've found if you do, you can get like a bit of a halo effect type thing. You can sort of see a bit of a ring around there. Um, I knew that the colour was good, so I didn't really worry too much about going a little bit up to that bonnet edge or the hood edge. Um, where it did go edge to edge up there. So I obviously did take the drying times out there. I did edit them out. Um, it would probably be about as enjoyable as watching paint dry to uh, watch that paint dry. Although I did have a comment the other day. Someone said you make watching paint dry interesting. So if anyone was going to be able to do it, it'd have to be me, wouldn't it? Anyway, I've obviously gone out and mixed my clear coat up. And by the time I've done that, cleaned out the red out of my base coat colour gun, straight back in the booth, and we're right to put our clear coat on. I did give it a bit of a tack cloth down, as you most likely just saw me do then. That's just over those blend areas, because sometimes the metallic and the overspray from your base coat can sort of land on those areas and if you don't tack rag it you can end up with like a bit of a grainy type it looks like sand sort of someone's thrown a handful of sand in your paint so tack rag that off and then you're right to clear obviously using my brilliant new Deville Burst GTI Pro Light Nebula with the TE20 air cap on it it's been my go-to setup for quite some time the TE20 1.3 and it gives uh, consistent results and I know what I'm going to get out of this gun. The gun obviously made it into number one spot in my top 10 spray guns of all time and it would still remain there. If I was to redo that, it would still be right up there at number one. I had a guy recently tell me that he's sort of more a DIY type guy and he gone and bought himself a Sata Jet 5000. I think he said a 1.3 on it or something like that. And he said it was like putting a AK-47 assault rifle into a three-year-old's hands. It was just way too much for him, a bit hard for him to control. And I would probably agree with that, even in professionals' hands, they can be a little bit hard to control. I've actually got a Segola coming in soon. I was recently contacted by Segola and they said that they would like to send out their new 4600 Extreme. Uh, they saw my review on the 4500 Extreme. They read the comments and they took that on board and they said, hey, we'd like to send you out our new one. And I replied with uh, the same as I always do when people send anything out. I say, well, there's terms and conditions for sending me out anything. You are open to any criticism. I'm not selling out for the sake of anything. And uh, yeah, they said, no, we're confident enough in our gun and we'd like it in your hands to do with what you will. So I am really looking forward to getting it, but it would have to be one hell of a gun if it was to take out number one uh, above the pro light. If any of you guys are interested in some more technique videos and unedited raw footage, be sure to check out my raw channel. I've actually been spending a bit more time over there lately, doing a few more uploads and just doing some minor edits on those videos. So I've been putting some music on in the background and just uh, sort of you know trying to spend a bit more time on actually uh, bringing the quality up on that raw channel so so if you would like to see more of the prep work and the masking stage on this car I've got a couple of videos I've made I'll be uploading them soon to the raw channel once I've got them up there there'll be a couple of little cards that you can click on and jump over there so jump over there give it a sub and have a look around if it interests you check out some videos see what you think if it interests you keep watching and hit that subscribe button but if not don't worry the standard gunman videos aren't going to be going anywhere I've been getting some good feedback on my raw channel lately so I'm going to continue to um, yeah upload as much as I can it's been good to have that little bit more time on my hands lately and paint some brilliant nice new cars like this and I'm not doing stupid hours so I've actually got that little bit more time that I can spend on the editing and uploading more quality content for you guys be sure to give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed watching it there's a couple of videos here at the end if you'd like to check them out spray painting for beginners and primer work for beginners couple of popular uploads there now you've seen this video get out there and paint some shit thanks for watching and this has been another gunman production goodbye